Life is a series of echoing hiccups. Culture is a series of Russian nesting dolls. The mid to late 1960s in London, aka the swingin' 60s, was a time of young people changing the status quo and liberating themselves from the archaic restrictions of the past. Music, fashion, art, it is the cultural export of the era. The kinks, the who, mod culture. We all want to find ourselves. On some level, it always comes back to identity. We know who we are. It's the decade of very stank organ solos. Last Night in Soho is a film directed by Edgar Wright and written by Edgar Wright and Christy Wilson Cairns. She wrote 1917 and quite a few episodes of Penny Dreadful. Their first real conversations about this film were in basements in Soho and very much not getting here. On the night of the Brexit vote, I sure bet that set a tone. I'd have gone full Dario Argento too. Okay, so this piece, at times, is probably going to feel like a psychedelic acid trip because, believe it or not, before the internet, artistic and cultural movement existed in cities, boroughs, neighborhoods. When it comes down to it, we never stop subdividing ourselves into smaller and smaller groups in an effort to belong. Who are we? Our story is set in Soho in the 1960s, and I think that's what is so brilliant about Edgar Wright's work. I cannot on any level comprehend that the chaotic comic wonder of a film like Scott Pilgrim was conceived and executed by the same director that made The Last Night in Soho. Really? Yeah. Also, just real quick while we're here, I I don't know why it's called Soho. It's in the west of London, and apparently it was a rallying cry back in the 1700s when it was a field. Google it. This is all neither here nor there, but luckily the entire history of London only complicates doing a piece about this film. This is London. Someone's died in every room and every building in this whole city. As Edgar himself has referred to this film, a dark valentine to Soho and not quietly a caution of London as a whole. It's not what you imagine, London. Grant. You've got to look out for yourself. I know. No, I'm going to say it anyway. There are lots, got of, to bad guys. lots of bad guys. Lots of bad people. Ba Town's built on quite a few bodies, if you will. But he's also deeply in love with it. The shadowy valentine. To say this film is outside of Edgar Wright's wildly inventive wheelhouse is kind of an understatement. A film at its simplest constructed from conversations Edgar had with his own mother about the swing in 60s in London. A time of free, expressive, beautiful creation. Because that's what gets remembered. It wouldn't be difficult to say that this movie is a caution against romanticizing the aspects of the past you dream about and ignoring the parts worthy of feedback or reflection. This isn't just a horror film. It directly litigates where artistic inspiration even comes from. And I think that's what took me a minute to make a piece on the only Edgar Wright film I haven't. It's not American history, so I know less about it. But it is film history, so let's go. Get ready for a whirlwind tour of mod music, giallo horror films, and yeah, fashion. What is giallo, you might be asking? <laughs> well, lucky for you, it's really hard to define. It's vibes, man. Originally, originally, it was sort of pulpy, cheap crime thrillers known as It Giallo Mandadori, but it's because they were bright yellow. It, giallo means yellow. It goes back to the late 20s, itself sort of influenced by noir and stuff in America. It's all, art is all one big washing machine. The pulpy crime novel eventually becomes more of a slasher film presence. Dario Argento is a great place to start with giallo, especially deep red. I'm just gonna keep mentioning deep red. They're graphically violent in a artistic way, but more importantly, the victims are often beautiful women. All right, let's go back. I've said it before in the Fave 5 vid, but Last Night in Soho is single-handedly the greatest season of Project Runway ever made. Yes, fashion is art. It is a form of free expression. It has, through all of history, loved 
gallivanting alongside film and music. Fashion is the most basic form of expression, combining both horror and the fashion industry. It's the same. It's the same picture. This is, it is not the first movie to say this. In many ways, this is a personal film. Edgar's stories about his mom's less than rose-colored memories of the swing in 60s, and he just happens to be illustrating that through the language of horror cinema in Italy that reverberated with people all over the world. Okay, so we're gonna find ourselves, but perhaps we perceive ourselves limited by, you know, ghosts and perceivably differing, though visibly colliding planes of existence. Who am I? Eloise Turner is heading off to fashion school. Stop me if you've heard this one. She is a medium of sorts. She still sees her mom, who is dead, in the mirror, even though she's been gone for a while. Who am I? You gotta find it. And maybe go through a little Italian 60s horror to get there. Allow me to extract some very high level plot bits very quickly about this film. Whoa. One, Eloise is not immediately ready for the big city, but the big city does not know that Eloise is the final girl. Two, Two the first man she meets in London is gross. So you're a model? Three. Three. At first, she shows up in her own clothes and has trouble making friends with all the mean girls. Four. Four. Eloise moves out of the dorms and instead rents an upstairs kitchenette from a lovely lady named Mrs. Collins, played by the perfect Diana Rick. This film is dedicated to her and her memory in true Edgar Wright fashion, the things she tells her about the room. Back when round here was a bad spot. Five. Five. Ellie spends a day getting acclimated, dreaming whimsically about the swing in 60s. If I could live any place in any time I'd live here, London in the 60s. Must have felt like the center of the universe. Six. Eloise falls asleep and dreams of London in the 1960s, and we are there. She does find herself, and it ends in a complicated place. Seven. They deserved it. I know. It isn't supposed to be clean. Ellie literally confuses a man she believed to be the one that murdered She's Sandy, here. and you he gets killed as a result. <laughs> That's a lovely name. It can't be hard to pin the somewhat mythological giallo subgenre down. A mystery generally of the icky varietal is at the heart of the story. We follow an outsider looking in from their outcast position. You're watching a movie about how cool things attract bad self-serving actors. You might as well just plan a Suspiria Last Night in Soho double feature, but if you're not a basic bee like me, go with Deep Red. They are excessively violent, but it is always in a generally over-the-top way. But before we get to all that, I want to talk about the simple connection at the center of this movie. There's an honesty on display in the film that is disarming. The film is only as horrifying as it is true, and truth plays an interesting role in this banger of a movie. This film was co-written by Christy Wilson Cairns, who worked at bars in Soho, including the Toucan featured in this film. I saw this film originally in the theater, and there was one line that stuck out to me. It seemed clever and silly, the line in question, and I apologize for the crassness of this line, but it 100% illustrates the point I am making. <coughs> My dick just dies. Can I bury it in your eyes? I feel like video essays exist for moments in cinema like this. Cinema. But did you know? That was a real pickup line that Christy heard in actual circulation in Soho. Also, reminder, she worked as a bartender at the bar where that line resides in the actual movie. She heard it while at work. And I sincerely appreciate that to do an essay on this film, you really do have to talk about this line. It delineates the movie from the moment extremely weird Terrence 
dampy stuff starts happening. It like, the bury my dick line is kind of the split into horror, which, which I will forever appreciate for the rest of my life. A movie about dualities in time. Dangle the Café de Paris and show up at the Rialto, a point the movie ends up underselling because Anya Taylor-Joy burns the roof off her rendition of Downtown at the Rialto. Downtown. Well, then she has to do this at the Rialto right after she kills the audition, so I actually, the point is well made. But back to Café de Paris, the real Café de Paris that only just now closed because of COVID. Uh, Diana Rigg used to go there back in the day. The massive recreation of the club struck her when Edgar gave her a tour of the set, a perfect recreation that quickly filled her with nostalgia. It was when Diana got to the staircase, very much featured in this movie, that the memories turned bitter. I really feel like this point needs to be stressed and underlined. Diana remembered the feeling of coming down the staircase leading to the parade in front of the men. A menu parading as a hot, trendy place to hang. And it, they really did this. Like the thing that bugged her literally is part of this movie. It's in the narrative. I, I, there's no way to undersell that. Diana Rigg is Sandy. The nostalgia for 1960s London is eventually quite bitter. So let's set all the giallo of this movie aside for a moment and just talk about the two characters intertwined at the center of it, Sandy and Eloise. Sandy, a gifted performer who has all of the right skills to make it. Sandy did everything right, and a pompous fart blaster ruined her life. That's probably an understatement. Allow me to rephrase. This abusive, pompous fart blaster used the reality of the time to systematically abuse women for his own profit. Sandy was cheated out of a good life. She should be bitter. Her past is bitter. And the crux of our giallo-soaked story is drawn from this. Ellie sort of says a bunch of untrue things to the police, like that Sandy was murdered in her room. It's all one blanket misunderstanding, but the important bit is that Ellie fights for something that is completely untrue. And when Ellie starts to come to terms that the killer she's been chasing slash running from is Sandy. It just hits different. They deserved it. I know. Sandy killed the one part of 1960s London that objectively sucks, which makes Ellie's ultimate fashion epiphany ring true. The art of the 60s informed her how to use the aspects of fashion from that era and jettison all the stuff that doesn't matter or is kind of gross. It's a lovely night. It's a beautiful commentary on where inspiration actually comes from. The little ideas burrow into your head and you have no choice but to work them out. In this case, a mystery. Who killed Sandy? Well, you did. This ghostly connection between two people in two time frames, romanticizing what you think the story is only to find out it's pretty much exactly everything you thought it wasn't. Kind of a literal metaphor for the toxicity of misplaced nostalgia, don't you think? And this ghostly connection is what brings us completely back to the 60s and 70s giallo influence on this film. A time when ghastly horror was beautiful, though the misogyny of the timeline is pretty difficult to undersell here. It's a tribute, but also a direct commentary on Giallo itself. I'm certainly not here to discuss the shortfalls of Italian beauty horror, but it is worth mentioning that while this film carries the tenets of Giallo on its sleeve, Last Night in Soho is a toxic love letter to London made by a litany of artisans bringing their freaking A-game. A mystery movie where our central decision is only ever on the wrong track. Ellie is actively allowing the mystery killer to murder her over a late night spot no. I mean, I know you're not going to tell anyone else. 
Also, in this point is infinitely clear to anyone with the eyes or ears, but God damn, Diana Rigg swung for the fences on this final performance. A villain, but not really. A genius born in the wrong era. I appreciate this level of departure for Edgar. A love letter to a period of time while outwardly acknowledging its shortcomings in an entertaining way. This is a beautiful celebration of cinema while also adding to it and evolving it. You know, the thing the movie is about, a movie about two women separated by time and one can't save the other. Okay, this was really heavy. Let's do, let's do something light, light. Let's go lighter. Part three, part three, a lighter tone. Edgar Wright is a wizard. Thank you for coming to my TED talk, good night. Oh, what do you mean this is only part three? Fine. Life is a series of echoing hiccups. So let's go to film school to illustrate the psychotic telemetry of shot design in this film. I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about the Texas switch, traditionally a film term for switching from the stunt person to the featured actor using a simple magic trick of character blocking and a well thought out camera angle. Let us go to film school and I'll do it with a true banger of classic cinema, the naked gun. The actor Leslie Nielsen before our eyes executes a perfect dive roll into position. But curious, does he? Is that the joke? Let me know in the comments down below if you think Leslie Nielsen did the stun or not. I really, I do. Who's to say? The essence of a Texas switch is essentially a magic trick. You know what you're seeing isn't possible in the camera and yet there it is. Think of it like that anti-Tom Cruise, I guess. In the case of Last Night in Soho, it is the scene where Ellie goes back to 1960s London for the first time. Anya Taylor-Joy and Thomas and McKinsey float elegantly in and out of frame, partaking in the same choreography as the same character divided by a magic trick. I think the creation of this shot is one of the more impressive in recent cinematic memory. It it has one base conceit that I actually think makes it more impressive, considering the quality of mastery of technique on display. It's as close to 100% in camera as you can get with one hilarious and minor caveat. They shot the opening move twice. But here where Thomason comes into it, which basically we did by repeating the steady cam move at exactly the same place. But it's not a motion control shot because it's such a long steady cam shot. Our amazing camera operator, Chris Baines, just basically repeated the same move. I'm sure there is some extremely minor cleanup associated with this, but it is an absolute testament that he just shot the opening spin precisely the same way twice with two separate actresses and used the robotically precise acting of Matt Smith's to divide between them. Oh, and then just just did one of the most incredible one or Texas switch parades I've ever seen. Uh, do the do the clappy sound. There's a video going around of how they actually shot this, and it's refreshing to see this amount of effort on display at the movies. We should celebrate what people are able to achieve with an inside of a camera. This is a basic tenet of filmmaking. Ooh, ah, effort, majesty. But maybe the switch goes deeper and darker than that. After all, Matt Smith's Jack does a Texas switch on Sandy, presenting one reality and delivering entirely and self-servingly another. The seamless grift the subtle spell placed upon reality. This is how it is and how it should be. You see what I want you to see. You don't really even need to know how it was done to be impressed by it. 
I really enjoy this film because it is playing its own tune, harmonizes with other generations while being categorically its own thing. A giallo-infused supernatural story that ends up saying, no matter who you are, there's a place in the world for you. The echoing hiccup. Art is supposed to be imperfect because it's a representation of humanity. Yadoi. It should help us find the way out of the dark. Gee shucks, what if part four is a nightmare as well? Please don't do- oh. Crap. Nostalgia is a strange and powerful opiate. Though, perhaps, he asked rhetorically, what if there are two nostalgias, a good and a bad, and being hit one right after the other with the good nostalgia and then the bad, maybe it's the sadness you can't shake in between that, that makes the difference. Shouldn't I be happy? Who am I? Perhaps good nostalgia is learning and growing from the past while bad nostalgia is encouragement to repeat it. We have to determine for ourselves how we weaponize our limited understanding of the past, especially against those around us. You can simply buy and own all of the art, and now the people will come exclusively to you. Congrats, you solved art. It's raining yachts, baby! But that's not how people or art work. Perhaps good nostalgia is the anchored insistence that nostalgia for the toxic aspects of our shared history is bad nostalgia. We express ourselves through our limited viewpoints. Art is emotional catharsis far more often than it is true societal change. But nostalgia unchanneled is just feelings with nowhere to go. Eloise idolizes the 60s, the time her mother came from, the time she is most interested in, but she idolizes the culture of the time, the music, the fashion, the nightlife, with no real frame of reference for the seedier and more dangerous aspects of the time or neighborhood. It's a sad story, some say a horror story. And Eloise finds the method to channel it. But it's simply too late for Sandy. Who am I? The answer to that is just as much where you were born as when. Beware the past, but embrace the aspects that will aid you in the future. There isn't a canonical checklist for art, so the literal best thing you can be is yourself. Who am I? You gotta find it. See this as the come down from all that junk. Okay, I guess that ends our uh, spooky time for today. But if you need more movies of Mikey, I have super good news for you. If you want the pristine versions without cuts for YouTube, they're on Nebula right now. And if you want them a month early, I have even better news. Listen up, cool kids. Hey, chin up. We all made it this far. Let's keep going. Art thrives in darkness. It's difficult not to feel insane if you even turn on the news right now. What is Nebula, you ask? Nebula is a platform created by and for creators, so there's no algorithm to fight, and Nebula allows us to upload our videos without fear of copyright strikes. And if you're wondering, currently I am super obsessed with Archaeology Quest. An experiment is underway. And normally we're behind the camera exploring science and anthropology. We're getting our hands dirty in a competition to see who could have survived in the Paleolithic era. I have a particular Paleolithic itch to scratch, apparently. Don't forget, you can also sign up for an annual membership for just $30 a year. Both links are in the description, so please check it out if you're looking for a great way to support Filmjoy and creators just like us. So go check out Nebula at nebula.tv slash filmjoy. I did something truly outlandish this year for the Fave Five. I made a whole episode where I just talk about movies, uh, cause I missed doing that a little bit. So I, I talked about all the stuff we loved in 2023. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. It's Fave Five, it's already on Nebula. I'll see you in the next, next video.